Checking In with Anthony and Glenn is brought to you by HD Supply. It's Checking In with Anthony and Glenn. Teaching you to be the hotelier that you want to be. It's Checking In with Anthony and Glenn. Hey Anthony, what's up? What is up, Glenn? We are here at the Jacob Javits Center. Who was Jacob Javits? Uh, he was a cool dude from New York City, and I wish I did my homework on remembering who he was. There was a time, though, he when was I a knew senator. who he was. A senator, that's right. And he was a big deal in helping develop uh, this part of the city, which is the west side right. of the city. And he was a real uh, go-getter, and uh, I believe he ran for mayor a couple times. I don't really remember. Huh. But anyway, he was kind of cool 70s guy. I remember in the 70s growing up. Right. But it's great to be at the Javits Center. Yeah, it really is. And uh, they've done a nice job kind of uh, redoing this property over the last couple of years. This was really like a really old school, outdated conference center, uh, convention center. And they just like rebuilt it from the inside out, kind of like how they're putting a new airport in LaGuardia, replace the old airport. Yeah, it's, right? it's about time. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 we tr- we, You and I travel all over the world. and. It's, it's crazy when you travel over the world and you realize everybody else's airport is nicer than ours. And I just was in the, I was just like in kind of a Javits Center in, in yeah. Italy, and it was nicer than Javits Center. But the Javits Center, as you say, is getting better. You know what's interesting about the Javits Center? I would love to know something interesting. What happens if you have a booth at a convention and you're trying to sell, let's say, linen right. to, to the hotel business during the hotel show? Right. Because we're here today during the HX Hotel Experience, which is the hotel show. Right. And BDNY, two shows in one. That's great. Mm-hmm. That's right. You come and you get two shows in one. And what happens if you just happen to plug in, I don't know, let's say a light. You need a light. You want to plug in a light into That's the right. wall. Mm-hmm. What happens? Uh, you try plugging it in yourself, and then someone from the union comes and yells at you and threatens you. Mm, a little bit. A little bit. Less intense. Okay. <laughs> what they do is a bomb comes from the roof, right. and you cease to exist. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, and no one ever knows what happened to you. I heard a story yesterday, uh, a buddy of mine, and we do have a guest on the show because you read in the show notes, and we'll bring him in in just one second. But I, uh, this buddy said the first year he came, he's just a, you know, he's just a go-getter, and he set up the booth himself, and then uh, he came back the next day, the entire booth was gone. They took it apart, put it in the back room, and then said, well, it's Sunday if you want to set it up, the price is double, and <laughs> we have to do it for you. That sounds about right. Right. And that's frustrating to me because New York City is such a great city, but I always hear complaints about how expensive it is to do an event here. And I'd really like to see uh, it be a little bit more approachable by the folks that are spending all the cash here because then they could use that cash to spend it in our great city. Right. And they kind of do. And that's what's great about these shows. I mean, and honestly, it's like Vegas. If you do a show in Vegas, everybody comes. If you do a show in New York, a lot of people come. That's right. There's only, you know, it's the greatest city in the world. But what's exciting about our guest that's coming on in just a minute is he had the same job as I had for a long time. I know. So without further ado, let's bring on Gary Eisenberg, who is with LWH Hospitality Advisors. Hi, Gary. Good morning. Good morning, Anthony. Good morning, Glenn, how are we doing today? Uh, You know, doing great, Gary. It's so super to see you. Now, I've been instructed not to say another word until Anthony speaks. Well, he already took my thunder (laughs) because I was going to say it's great to have you here. When he stops cackling, I'll talk. <laughs> which, which, I can't uh, help it. Anytime I'm with you guys, I'm just very happy. Maybe we should just turn his mic off. Yeah, How's I that? think that would be good. It should be called uh, Checking In With Anthony and Glenn Without Glenn Show. <laughs> and, uh, the, but but um, I was going to say something, but he took my thunder. But he introduced you too quickly. We had the same job. I worked uh, at a company to, called Tishman here in the city. and I was an asset manager. And um, actually, I was going to say asset manager. Uh, because everybody, that, when you're an asset Isn't that manager, more of an HR role. And everybody, and everybody, <laughs> when you're an as- asset manager, nobody likes you, and they all call you an ass anyway. So I just, I call myself asset manager. But anyway, I put the ass in asset manager. That's what I heard. That's what I heard. So go ahead. Be sure go to ahead. check out Gary. And <laughs> so, so, so my first question to you, I wanted to ask. The first question was, for people who don't know what an asset manager is, you can have a management company that runs a hotel. Uh, for a franchise, so say for like uh, Marriott, you have a management company, and the management company can have their own asset manager for that hotel, or the owner can have an asset manager for that hotel. So the asset manager is supposed to basically make pennies fart, and they're not really getting involved in the operations, and they're really just a pain in the ass at the end of the week. They come in, or the end of the month, and they crunch all the numbers, and they tell you what you're doing wrong. So I did that for two years, and that was about as fun job as I've ever had in my life, not true. But the question is, is how often, when you walk through the door, are people happy to see you? 
Uh, it's a really good question. Not very often, at least from the operations standpoint. Owners are usually a, is happy. Is this at this home? Or <laughs> <laughs> the owners are happy to see you because you're making the money. Correct. So, so explain what an asset manager does because on this show, one of the things we try to do is, is we try to explain all kinds of uh, different positions in the hotel and not sexual positions, but job positions. Right. And uh, so tell me what an asset manager, although an asset manager could be a sexual position, but <laughs> t- 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 tell me what kind of job I'm is I'm not sure I can manager. stay on this show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I think we've already got an explicit <laughs> warning on this one. <laughs> uh, but Gary, before you speak, I did want to just uh, say one other thing. For all of you folks out there that are following the show, because you're really career-minded professionals, there are so many other great opportunities out there beyond just stuff at the hotel level. I wish I knew that early on in my career, and I wish there were opportunities that I knew about such as yours. Sorry, Gary, take it away. So what was the question again, Anthony? I'm sorry. Are people ever happy to see you? First of all, explain what an asset manager does, sure. and then explain why they would be happy to see you or not happy to see you. So the way our perspective, the way we take our asset management is, one, we look at the numbers. Everything is data-driven. Um, but we work collaboratively with management. You know, we're not there just to, to pinpoint what management is doing wrong or not doing. Our role is to work with them to help find and identify areas of improvement. Now, usually when we come in, I, I agree, we're, we're a threat. We're, we're seen as a threat. Why are you a threat? People perceive us as a threat, not Why? necessarily that we are a threat. Just because I'm not sure if anyone really likes people looking over their shoulder, per right. se. It's kind of like that when that consultant comes into the office, everybody gets all nervous because they think that, you know, they're going to be judged for what they're doing. Well, I kind of, when, when they get a call from us, it's kind of like getting a call from the IR, IRS. Right, okay. You know, they feel like someone's looking over their shoulder. What did I do wrong? How is this going to cost me money? Is this going to cost me my job? What is this? Um, but... At the end of the day, we come in and very quickly we, we prove out to management that we're working collaboratively with them. We're not, we're not right. there to hit them over the head. We're basically there to work with them, help them identify things. We do it in a very soft approach and we do it collaboratively. So what specifically does an asset manager then do? Because I think people confuse that with a management company. So if you ask 10 people what asset management is, you'll get about 100 different answers. Um, what way we look at it is we come in and we work and report directly to ownership. So we, we're, we're representing, we're, if you look at it, we're an owner's advocate. Management companies sometimes can be brand advocates, can also be ownership advocates. Um, but we come into it and we're purely working on the behalf of ownership. So we work with management to identify and improve profitability for owners. So what are some of the things that you would identify? Like, oh, there'd be, you'd you'd be able to activate the space and make more money, that kind of a thing? Sometimes it could be a value add. Sometimes it could be looking at renovations and how we spend the renovation dollars. Times it could be looking at payroll production and how we improve housekeeping productivity. There's a wide variety of things. Oh, I like that. Coming to my hotel as a general manager, you're an asset manager, and you're telling me how to be more productive in housekeeping. And after I did a really good P&L and you're still trying to get more pennies from me, you know what I say? I say the Brooklyn hello. <laughs> well, see, the, here's our approach to that. You know what the Brooklyn hello is? What is that? It starts with a G, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then the next word starts with an F, and the next word's uh, a Y. And there's a self in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, there's a self in there. Very good. Oh, why you're smart. <laughs> I've heard that before, <laughs> and not being smart. Um, <laughs> but anyway, and, you know, to answer your question, the way we look at that and the way we handle that is the first thing we do, if you ask a general manager what their maid's productivity is, most of them will, will, will come where, somewhere around equating to about 30 minutes a room, whether that's seven hours per shift, I mean, 14 hours per shift, or 15 hours per shift, depending on how they do their payroll and so forth. Um, what we then do is we calculate the actual production. And what's interesting is a lot of times the actual production is a lot different than what a general manager thinks it is. So we try to work, then we work with the management team and the manager to help kind of move that productivity to where it should be. Do you do it with heart or do you do it as, a, as an ass at manager? We do it with heart. We, you know, we're not sitting there just looking at the number and saying this is what the number you need to be. Why are we different from the num- what the number is? And that's what we try to understand is the why. Maybe there's a good reason. Or maybe it can be improved. Maybe they don't know what the reason is. So we try to understand the root cause. Right, and you have a background in house pattern. I mean, you've worked at the line level position, so you really right. understand what it's like. So talk to me about a little, a little bit about that experience. So I began my career as a doorman, which was probably the most 
lucrative position I ever had in this industry. It was phenomenal. I worked at the Sheridan Russell on 37th and Park Avenue. When I tell people how much a doorman makes in a year in New York City, no one believes me. And I'll just, I'll, you, you don't have to say the number, but I'll just say a doorman minimum wage in a good hotel, busy hotel in New York City with tips and salary is minimum 100 grand. Yeah, totally. Agreed. Minimum. Minimum. Right. That's a bad year. That's a bad year. Right. And People don't a, believe me. That's a high, good volume hotel. Yeah, but right. I th- isn't that starting to change now when you have um, Uber and Lyft coming in? I mean, I, the, the, the folks, um, there are a lot of folks in Boston right now uh, on strike against a major hotel company because they're saying their wages have significantly dropped because people are taking Uber and Lyft and they're no longer tipping. My employees at the Algonquin, who are still there, who I absolutely love, my Bellman and Dorman there, and I, sh- I just saw him the other day, and um, you don't want to be an Uber driver and say hello to them or ask them to use the bathroom. <laughs> because they're taking but first it was yeah. t- 20 years ago or 15 years ago when all the rolling luggage happened so nobody needs help to their to their room okay number one number two then Lyft and Uber come in and people call them from their room they know that they're a minute away and then they make believe they don't see the doorman and bellman go right past the doorman and bellman and nobody wants help and I and again I've been I've been uh, guilty of that where I just kind of go in and out and just don't want to be bothered yeah. but when you're in New York City you know you need to do what you can to ensure these people, they're making a living, man. They're trying to make a living. Yep. Agreed. And I think, you know, with the doorman, they know how to work that front door. Yeah. So if there's an Uber or Lyft person standing out front, if they want to stay there, they'll take care of the doorman. Right. So Absolutely. So uh, tell us a little bit more about, you know, what, how did you get into being an asset manager? When did you realize that that was a viable career option? And what makes it such an interesting job for you? You know, about when I was with ITT Sheridan, I was a controller out at the Miramar in Santa Monica. And the ownership at that hotel had a very hands-on approach. They had a management contract with Sheridan at the time that was by far much more superior than any other owner ever had. They were paying, like, for example, the loyalty program, they paid 50 cents to the dollar to compare to what other owners paid and so forth and so on. So I, I looked at that owner and admired him and said how, how, and he was an owner's rep, how did he get to that point? How did he ha- make that happen? And it made me think that maybe there was a business model there. Fast forward, you know, about 15, 20 years later, and here I am in this business. But over those 20 years, it kind of emerged. And I think a lot of it emerged of, of asset management as investment in hotels become, became more mainstream. Uh, you know, with hedge funds and, and funds and, and companies focus on investing in hotels for profitability, they realized that they needed to maximize returns and, and asset management became a kind of viable And one of the things, so. when I was the first vice president at Tishman, I was in charge of the Westin Hotel, um, which is a the billion dollar. The one at 42nd and 8th? 42nd and 8th. Mm-hmm. And it was a billion dollar hotel. And I actually had an a, uh, office on the same floor as the general manager, which isn't always a great place to, to have your office Correct. for the general manager. Um, and we also, I was helping develop the Intercontinental across the street. I was just one of many, many, really? many people that was involved in that. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't there at the opening. Um, Th- I was that's there too right bad. You the missed uh, getting to go to the Shake Shack. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, that was supposed to be all retail when I was, when we were planning it out. And it became Shake Shack, which is doing tremendous. But anyway, um, and one of the things I realized is as an operator my whole life, 30 something years, is I'm so involved in the minutia, everything from you know making sure rooms are clean to the banquets, everything, that you do sometimes forget about six months from now, a year from now, capital expenditures, things like that. So when I became an asset manager in Tishman, all they wanted to really consider or look at was, okay, they're dealing with the operation. Your job is to go in and figure out how to help them make more money and how to be more efficient six months from now, a year from now, and Correct. what does design look like? However, because I'm an operator and because I have a heart for operations, it was a little difficult for me to be perfectly honest with you. I met some of my best friends um, in that hotel. I'm dear friends with the general manager uh, who's now out in California. Um, I'm very good friends with the uh, two uh, prior uh, revenue managers. And that's you, not really... Uh, People don't like that. People don't like when the asset manager becomes friends with the employees that work there. Matter of fact, there was one uh, person that I used to go to lunch with. We used to have to hide because, like, why are you going to lunch with one of the operations managers? But we were just friends. Yeah. And I actually got more information that way than I did by just being an asset manager. I was right. going to say, now I know why there was ass and asset manager. Right. There. And, and so so it was, it was a little complicated for me, to be honest with you. It was not – I don't know if it was my favorite job, and I don't think I was – the best at that job, to be perfectly honest with you, because I really saw the uh, 
how hard people work, 18 hours a day, 12 hours a day, 16 hours a day, six days a week, and how intense and stressed they were because it was such a big hotel that I did ask the hard questions and I didn't play games and I, and I wanted to make money for, for the company. Um, but I don't know if I'm wired as an asset manager. Fair. I, I think, you know, as an asset manager, I think the skill that's needed is be able to see the trees through the forest. Because when you're operating a hotel, a lot of times you can get caught up in the moment and not necessarily see the long-term plan. Yeah, good way to put it. Um, I think also, uh, we also make sure we put in the right processes and measurements in place. Because I'm a firm believer that the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Right. And what gets measured gets done. So if, you put the, if you're tracking things and you want to see improvements, you put measurements and do it. Because we're naturally, all of us want to succeed in life. So if I'm being measured and I know my performance is going to be ranked based on some measurement, I'm going to want to make that measurement improve. Right, but Glenn actually wakes up in the morning to be a failure. I he know. Actually, <laughs> and he's doing a really good job. Well, well I'm failing miserably at it. <laughs> <laughs> We're Give succeeding at failing. So, so I want to, with no, like, you know, pull, a, pull, pull the band-aid off. I want to know the one time a general manager just, you and the general manager just couldn't get along and just hated you. And how'd you handle it? You know, there... There's many, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> they start off that way, but then we, we figure so that's, out. So it's naturally when you walk in, they reflexively are uh, on the defensive. When we walk in, you can see right away the right. hair goes stand up on the back of the neck. Yeah. Uh, people feeling uncomfortable, you know, a little edgy in their seat and so forth, being very defensive. And very quickly, we what we do is we sit down and we start going through the numbers. We explain our role. We go, you know, we have a little pitch that we give them and saying that we're there to work collaboratively and so forth. But that usually doesn't go over. You know, they don't really, not very receptive to that. They're still very defensive. I wouldn't be. Correct. And I think the key is the proof in the pudding. Is It, it is our approach. Um, I mean, I can list operators that we work with that, that would love to see us in other asset management gigs. And there's competitive, uh, competitors of ours that come across in a little bit more of a hostile environment. And that's not our approach. So, so your question is, would, would, give me an example where GM couldn't stand me and was very defensive. Um, I would say all of them start off that way, but usually we win them over very quickly. Uh, we have a client where we're, we're asset managing four hotels that are managed by the same management company, and the management company was extremely defensive, did not want us involved at all. And little by little, we're, we're pulling back and we're able to get in, and, and we take little steps. You know, the first step was, let's look at the marketing plan, let's look at rates, let's look at this. And little by little, we, we read our way in and start showing a collaborative way. I had a similar experience. I didn't realize I had that experience yeah. until recently. I, w I built a little hotel for an owner, um, and I won't name where, because people are probably listening to this podcast. Uh, I would hope so. That, 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 <laughs> that I've been involved with. And um, the owner, after it was developed, I was done. I named it, helped design it, although the designer was amazing. Um, and I said, I'm not interested, because there wasn't enough money there for me to keep me interested. They paid my fees, and I, and I said, but, you know, they're bunch of management companies out there, you know, find them. So they came to, to me with a management company and I checked them out and I said, it seems, they seem fine. Mm -hmm. They seem better than most and most of them suck, but this one seems pretty good. Um, and a couple years later, the owner came back to me and said, hey, could you do some work for me as an asset manager? I said, I'm really, it's not really what I do, but for you, I'll do it. I'll, I'll make a couple calls a, a, a month and I'll help you out and I'll make sure they're on the straight and narrow because, you know, the, the rate wasn't where they wanted it to be. Oh my God, the the ownership, or not the ownership, the management company got all defensive, all crazy, right? All like, why is he coming in? So I basically called him up, and said, "Listen, if I wanted this, I could have had it before you had it. So I'm not coming in to take it. I don't want it. If they gave it to me, I don't want it. I I don't have enough time, and there's not enough money there for, to make me happy. I don't want it." Um, they still were very, being very difficult. So I called the owner and said, you know, I love you guys. You guys are fantastic, but I'm moving on. I'm not fighting with your management company. I don't have the time, patience, because I'm not going to argue with them. Because my arguing isn't like, I'm not going to argue. I'm going right. to take it. I'm going to, I'm going to basically take your, I'm going to basically take the management contract. I'm going to make sure he throws you out. And take <laughs> so I'm not going to do it because there's only one way for me to do it is I'm going to get you fired and I'm going to take it over. And I didn't want to do that. So I just walked away from it. So I had, I didn't realize I had that experience. So it is not, nobody ever really wants you to come in. It's the way you go about it. Correct. And our most recent experience, we, we have, um, are asset managing for a client where they have a management company in place and we've asset managed this management company before. And the client and the management company were talking over and under each other, meaning- Which you know, is typical. Right, they just were not seeing eye to eye. Right. So we're coming in as a translator, so to speak, to get them to communicate better. And 
the management company actually welcomed the, welcomed us. They were very happy to see us there because they've worked with us before. And because they know your owners were arrogant and out of their mind. And well, I don't know if arrogance is the right word, but they they've just had a hard time communicating. They knew that we could help bridge the gap, and that's what we do. Mm -hmm. I'm loving this conversation, but we need to take a quick break. We'll be right back, right after a word from our sponsor. Hey everybody, Glenn here. So listen to this. Cobblestone Hotels is celebrating their 10th anniversary and man, have they accomplished a lot in the last decade. Already they have more than 150 hotels throughout the United States, but they're in smaller and medium sized markets. Those markets that the big franchise companies, they're underserving, they're overlooking, and in some cases just ignoring. But Cobblestone is an expert in these markets. And their president and CEO, Brian Wagernies, listen, I've gotten to know him in the last 10 years, and he has worked every job possible, including being an owner and operator. I can personally vouch for how awesome this company is, how awesome he is as an individual, because he understands the importance of finding the right combination of hotel brand and franchise owner. He's also an incredibly dedicated professional. Whether it's a cobblestone hotel and suites Main Street design, Borders Inn and Suites, or one of the newly acquired brands such as Boulders Inn and Suites, Key West Inns, Centerstone Inns and Suites, Cobblestone has brands that range from economy to upper mid-tier and one that's right for you. Quite simply, Cobblestone Hotels is the franchise for franchise owners. Patrick Mullenix, well, he's their cobble, he's Cobblestone's new president of franchise development. Give him a call or check out their website at cobblestonefranchising.com. But give Patrick a call. He's a great guy. I've known him for a really, really long time, too. You can find him at 920-216-0620. That's cobblestonefranchising.com. And tell him Glenn sent you. And again, maybe we haven't made this clear. When an owner buys a hotel, and either they have family money, investors' money, or bank money involved, they get the hotel built, they get the hotel branded, uh, they start going to work. They hire a management company, or they or they try to do it internally with their resources, or they get the brand to manage it for them. At some point, either early in the beginning or later, maybe three months, six months, or a year, or when shit goes sideways, they bring in an asset management company. And the asset manager company really is there to protect the investment for the investors, whether it be the bank or whether it be family money or other investors. They're not really there to provide uh, you know, a new level of service for the guest or to provide you know, what amenities you should have or what kind of bed you should have. It's simply to make sure that that mortgage gets paid, that interest gets paid, and a year from now that it gets paid, and then three years from now when we need to do a capital expenditure, that there's money in the bank for that capital expenditure, and that we're not wasting it on a bunch of crap, but we're wasting it on things that are gonna have uh, a, an ability to raise the average rate and increase occupancy. And that's really kind of in a nutshell what uh, asset manager and does. It's to, and it's to maximize value, right? Right. In the sense that whether that's value to ensure there's cash to pay the debt or to maximize value to make sure the owners get the right return on their investment. Do you sit in on the revenue management calls? Uh, we do. Yes, we do. So, that's fun. So, and that's where we get probably the greatest pushback. Right. 100%. That's why I mentioned it. Correct. Right. So why is it that um, the general managers and the management company need companies like you to come in. I think that's kind of the missing piece. What are they not well, seeing? Think, are they just too I, I close to it? I think their opinions, they don't need right. us. Right, right. Th th that's, that Until things it. go sideways, right. they don't need them. And right. then they realize they need I'll tell you why. If I, can I? Sure. I'll answer it mm -hmm. from my perspective and you can answer from your perspective. An owner is good at owning things, at, at raising money, right? An operator is good at operating things and building teams. It, that asset management job is is a nuance. It's 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 very sensitive. It's very um, you pull one little rope and all of a sudden you realize how much you just saved. Right. Or you push something and you realize how much money you can make. And when people are coming in and working twelve to fourteen hours a day and they're just worrying about getting a housekeeper to come come to duty. Uh, they're not really interested in six months from now and how we can kind of uh, make the wind shift. Right. So they're very focused on the day-to-day -day type of stuff and all of those challenges, and there's just not enough time for them necessarily to be uh, thinking uh, about uh, the uh, long term. Uh, right. And to give you an example, this right. would be a perfect example. You're an asset manager, you're a hotel owner, and I'm the operator. Okay. And this would be a typical conversation. Right. 
as a hotel operator, I don't have enough time. As the hotel owner, you're like, I'm not making enough money. And right. as an asset manager, you're like, okay, you shut up and you shut up and let me figure this out, let me manage You're a this. translator. An asset right. manager a lot of times is, it kind of translates. You know, if you look at like a ho someone that invests in a hotel, look at the things they look at, right? Cap they look at um, return on investment, you know, uh, residual cap rates, uh, all these terms that to a hotel operator has no idea what they're talking right. about. And meanwhile, a hotel operator is looking at room productivity, you know, room turnover, uh, pace of grouping books, ADR, all these types of other statistics. So we come in having an understanding of both and help, help to bridge the gap. Many times when an owner buys a hotel, they have a, a hold period in mind. Is it a long-term hold or is it a short-term hold? And how you go about that investment, whether it's long-term or short-term, how you deal with capital investments and, and renovations and so forth, is different. And, and it's so funny you, you need to understand that. And right. it's funny you say that because I worked for a hotel. And I, I'll say it because I love the owners, the Algonquin Hotel. And I remember about maybe six months in, they said, well, we don't know how long we're going to hold this hotel. could be three years depending on the cap rates, what's going on in the city, whatever. And I was insulted. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to kill myself. Right. And I'm going to turn this hotel around. And you're thinking about selling the hotel? I was upset. And until I realized was, well, this was just a play for them to make money, which is what business is and what right. real estate is. But operators fall in love with hotels. <laughs> so that's, and that gives us, you know, brings us to this point, I, I believe, is that there's a difference in career paths today, right? right? There's the hotel business and there's the business of hotels. 100%. And meaning the business hotels is, is being more on the asset management side, owning hotels uh, and so forth. And I so just on. spoke to a bunch of Cornell students, uh, which is today, Monday, Saturday. It's, I do it every year. It's called Hotel, uh, hotel -y Week uh, or, we, or Hotel -y Day in New York City. They go and speak to a whole bunch of people. And I'm always, the last two years, I've been asked to speak to them. So we went to Cut Steakhouse here in Midtown and or there in midtown i should say we're on the west side and i spent uh a couple of hours with 60 extraordinarily intelligent students that truly want to be in the hospitality business and junior seniors freshmen from cornell and at the end of it they all want to go into real estate they all want to go into development i don't think there was anybody in that audience that wanted to run the front desk because they spent sixty thousand dollars a year to go to college and i used to get offended by that if i want to be around operators i go to unlv and speak because unlv <laughs> students they're going to be operators right they're going to run those hotels out in vegas yeah. in cornell they're going to be developing all these hotels are being developed right. now in new york they're somehow involved in that matter of fact a gentleman gave me his card he was a junior and in, 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 on the back of his card he said intern for blackstone analyst and he's a junior right and this summer he worked for them you know in Blackstone so it's just very very interesting so they they will become a lot of those Cornell people will become asset managers right I, I gotta tell you guys that I really wish I knew that these were a viable career options earlier on sure I went down more of the editorial we would have made path. a hell of a lot more money right <laughs> and, and I, I mean I was just in an event last week and these guys are talking about what some some of the money these folks are making folks that are doing franchise sales folks that are you know developing properties and then flipping them it's a totally different universe so I think Gary um, the, the the last thing that I think is important to know from you is what are the skill sets that you need to have to be successful in that business it seems obvious that great people skills is just the beginning of it authenticity is the first thing right and I, from a skill set, I think you need to understand operations of hotels. You need to understand the revenue management process. You need to understand, you know, been in operations and worked in a hotel for a number of years. I also think from, you need to understand finance and you need to understand accounting and a little bit of real estate. You know, at least the terms. You know, I think having, being someone that was like myself that worked in the finance arena of hotels through the controllership and also was a general manager as well uh, and spent close to 20 years within the operations on a day-to-day -day basis within a hotel, gave me a good basis. But I think you need to have finance background as well as important. So many asset managers take over hotels and if you're an asset manager, you come over to me and I ask you your background and you have zero operation uh, have experience. No respect. Zero respect. So now you better be authentic and you better the words out of your mouth better be, I don't know anything about what you do for a living. Um, and you may or may not know what I do for a living. So let's have a cup of coffee and explain to each other what we do for a living. I'm here to support you, okay? If you can't be an athlete, I'll be your athletic supporter. <laughs> and, and so that you, makes you a total <laughs> dick. <laughs> no. So if, someone, so if someone comes at me like that, I'll give you an example. I was in Nickelodeon and I was the uh, vice president of operations. And they fly me out there. I'm, I'm going back and forth uh, Monday through Thursday. I work out there and then I come home to New York. And I remember getting everybody up on uh, this. Uh, I was up on the stage. It's, we had a huge entertainment complex. 
and I had 1,600 or 1,200, can't remember, employees. And I remember saying to them, I said, I've only been a general manager of one hotel, there are two hotels in New York City, up and down hotels, no swimming pools, no entertainment, never worked in Florida, never worked around kids. This is, this is a kid-inspired hotel. Uh, never ran an entertainment facility. Absolutely have no idea about running the Nickelodeon Family Suites. So who better than me to run the hotel? And everybody <laughs> left. Yeah. And I gave them my number and I said, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. So if you see me doing something stupid, call me on my cell phone and tell me. That, and that's uh, the authenticity part. And, that's, and I meant it. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And the whole time I bumbled around the hotel, they helped me. And finally, we started turning it around. And finally, I got confidence. But if I went in there without mentioning it, even if I went out in there authentic, and even if I went in there respectful, if I didn't make fun of myself, and if I didn't, if I didn't let myself in on a joke, okay, that I knew the joke already... They wouldn't have taken me seriously. Correct. And I think that's really, it's being humble, right? It's developing, figuring out how to develop that rapport and relationship. Well, like, I think and in some cases, being humble might be the right way, and, there, and there's other ways as well. I think it all depends on the relationship of that individual, and you, you work to figure that common ground. Was I being humble, or was I being smart? I don't know. Well, or both. I or think it's one uh, and the same. Uh, okay. Maybe. I think You're, it's uh, yeah. it's a, it's a very coy way of connecting right. with people. Right. Right. I, I didn't My do it to be coy, right. but I did it. I guess I was being smart and humble. I think right. you're being smart because sometimes, hey, maybe humble is what's needed. Right. But in another instance, humble is not going to work. So it's yeah. identifying yeah. What, what is, what's going to give you that edge. Yeah. When I fired the entire executive team, they realized I wasn't humble anymore. <laughs> 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 I got a call from the owner and said, um, we're coming down. I go, what are you coming down for? I just turned around the Algonquin for you. You know what I'm about. I'm going to make this happen. He goes, you fired 17 out of 18 executives. There's no executives. Just, no, that's not true. The chief financial officer is still here because I'm not stupid enough to fire my accountant because it's a big hotel. And they go, but you can't fire the entire executive team. It's too late. And, and then we turned it around and whatever. But at first I came in very humble. And then when the executives didn't want to kind of right. bend right. to my will... I bent for them. You know, it's interesting. You know, through my career, I've always identified unique ways of making your point and kind of stored them when I saw general managers or managers that I reported to that made an interesting way of making your point. And one story stands out in my mind. It was, it was the Sheridan Center, which is now the Sheridan, New York, I think, on 7th and 52nd. Right. 1,800-room hotel. Um, and they were having a problem with the loading dock. Loading dock was always filthy and not well kept. And it was a bad battle back and forth, whether it was food and beverage, whether it was stewarding, whether it was housekeeping. So the managing director of that hotel had its next operating staff meeting on the loading dock. Guess what? Following day, it was clean and it was never dirty again. So never had to say a word, just had the meeting there. It's that funny simple. funny you say that. Every one of my stand-ups in any hotel I work in, I always go to the venue that is the most important for the hotel. So at Nickelodeon, we used to have it in the entertainment complex on the stage. At the Algonquin Hotel, we had it in the cabaret around the piano. Uh, everywhere that I go, I always go to the most important uh, place in the hotel. And then what I do, depending on, like if I had a loading dock, we would change the venue for that morning and say, okay, everybody meet in the loading dock. Why are we meeting in the loading dock? For the same reason. I actually did something in Algonquin where I pulled out all the chairs and tables, got on my hands and knees after the renovation, realized they still weren't cleaning even after we gave them a renovated hotel. And I just put all the crap on the table. And I had all my team around me and I just walked away. Didn't yell, didn't scream, didn't say anything. Never had to speak again about it. It's not what you say. It's how you make people feel. And when you make people feel that you care and you, you don't need to yell and scream and you don't need to really make you know examples of people, they will appreciate that. So when I went with my hands and knees, I showed that I was vulnerable. And when I put it on the table and I walked away without yelling or getting pissed off or firing somebody, they understood. And that was a lot more powerful. Correct. Right. I remember one guy, I, I was at a hotel, and I opened up the door. I just took over, and the, and the, the room looked like um, there was a 12-inch snowstorm in the room, and then it all melted. Everything was moist. <laughs> the plants the plants looked like it just came out of a rainstorm, windstorm, snowstorm. And every, it just looked disgusting. And I said to the, to the gentleman, I said, what should I do right now? He goes, if I were you, I'd fire me. I said, you're fired. Yeah. He fired himself. He told me, he goes, if I were you, I'd fire me. You're fired. Well, at least he made it easy for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So uh, I, I think we've got to start bringing this one uh, home. So uh, any final thoughts, Gary? Anything that you, that you feel that we haven't covered that you think is important to say? Uh, probably. I think we've covered it all. But just to, to reiterate a few points. Is, is I believe an asset manager, you need a good quality background of operations as well as finance, and you're basically an interpreter. And you need to work collaboratively and find the wins and find the areas that you can, where you can show success 
by doing things collaboratively in a team in a team yeah. effort. And you never would. make it your idea in front of the in front of the uh, owner. No. Always make it the team support. Idea. Correct. It's always about support. Right. It's not about being in the ownership of it. Right. And that goes that back to breaking down the barriers between you and them to show that you are there to actually support them, and not be a threat to right. them. Because because if you come into a meeting with your ownership and you say, you know, one of the things that we did this year or this month was blah 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 blah, I'm going to get pissed off. If you came in and said what the team did this year was blah blah blah, I'd say, no, Gary, you were a big help in that, and we really appreciate you pointing that out to me. You know, without your help, we couldn't have got that done. If you if you say it the other way, I, I'm I'm not going to say anything, and then at the end, I'm going to say, dude, you what'd know, you do to me? what'd right. you do to me? Why'd you throw me under the bus, man? Give me my credibility, and then I'll give it back to you. And that's just that's just respect. Correct. And there's times, you know, and there, I have to tell you, there's times you do that very well and effectively, and there's other times where you do step on a few toes here and there. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's necessary. And sometimes it's necessary. Oh, sometimes right. I'll break your toe, and I'll tell you, that's right, I'll, I'll break <laughs> the other one next time you open your mouth. And sometimes you need to fire everybody but the CFO. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right. So we play a little game here at the end of our podcast. It's called Tell Me Something We Don't Know. So uh, if you need a second to think about it, I'll ask Glenn or I'll come up with something that we don't know. So tell me something we don't know. It has it have nothing to do with what you do for a living. Okay. So what's something we don't know? Um, I'm autist- I mean artistic, excuse okay. me. <laughs> uh, I actually am an oil painter. I, I do oil really? paintings. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. What, is, what's your, uh, what do you like to focus on creating? Uh, it's seascapes. It's all, about, it's all about water and beaches and things of that nature. And why? How'd you get into that? Uh, how'd I get into that? It's a really good question. Um, when I was young, my brother is musically inclined, and my brother actually was a, is a really good trumpet player and trained under the same person who, who taught Doc Severson and Maynard Ferguson and stuff, and he, he was brilliant, my brother, as a trumpet player. Me, on the other hand, I played five instruments, was awful at every single one of them. My brother, when he played the trumpet, we had a dog that used to howl and sing beautifully when my brother played. I also played the trumpet, and he growled and bit my feet when I played. <laughs> so I, my mother was constantly f- trying to find my edge, and finally it was uh, art class, and that's kind of what happened. Right. So children who are uh, my children, when I'm trying to find your edge, trying to help you find your edge, please be patient with me because it's important. You have to find your edge. Anthony, tell us something we don't know about you. Um, what you don't know is that it is now a month into me shattering my ankle yep. uh, and falling off a ladder, and I'm actually healing. I can finally put my foot down without a tremendous amount of pain, so I'm able to kind of uh, go to my meetings and kind of live my life. I'm going to my friend's hopefully 50th birthday party uh, in Florida this Saturday, but right now I still have the green light from my doctor, and hopefully I can get it tomorrow, but right now it's 50-50. And um, so I'm getting better. Probably six months in the boot, but um, I can put my foot down. But I'll be walking with the boot in about a month. Excellent. So, Glenn, tell me something we don't know. Uh, Well, I... uh I don't know if I'm excited about it or saddened by it, but I achieved diamond status. Uh, wow. It's uh, before before November started this year, so that was really That's exciting. That's a big deal. But it's, and I finally got access to the uh, the lounge, which is very exciting. <laughs> well, tell them what diamond status is and uh, what, what airline. I, I'm happen to, uh, I happen to follow Delta Airlines. I think they do uh, great service. and They fly all the routes that I like. Anywhere I need to go in the world, it's really convenient, and diamond status really allows me now to... Uh, board first it allows me to get a lot more potential for upgrades although there are so many diamond people i'm still sometimes way really? down that list yeah yeah it was coming back um from san francisco last week on an overnight flight on a sunday i was 12th after they gave away all of the seats Did, so you didn't get in i know I, no, uh, but i had my comfort seems- plus and uh <laughs> there was nobody in the middle seat and there was a very tiny woman to the to the right to the left of so me. you so were good i i was i was pretty good it was fine i passed out i had a, i had a good time and i may or may not have passed out because of the access to the free booze at, right, the, uh, <laughs> at the at the lounge well gary it's a pleasure tell people where they can find you in the uh in the name of your company again Thank you, Anthony. Uh, Gary Eisenberg at LWH um, Hospitality Advisors. I'm the president of the Asset Management Division, and I can be reached at gary.eisenberg at lwhadvisors, with an S, dot com. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. And Anthony, how can we find us? Anthony Hotels, anywhere you want to be on the internet. 
Excellent. And I, of course, am at Traveling Glenn everywhere you want to be on the internet. And be sure to subscribe to our show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and wherever you prefer to download And review our us, podcast. will you? We're not getting a lot of reviews. All the ones we're getting are good, but we're not getting a lot of oh, them. Oh, yeah, which I, we did get one last week. I'm totally oh, forgetting we? the woman's name, but she, uh, she, she say? did say that sometimes we've been straying a little too much into left-wing territory over I there. I saw that. I right? saw that. She still gave us five stars, and then she I said no she's idea. even starting to like me. I so. have no idea. I saw that. I have no <laughs> No <laughs> idea how anybody would get that we are left wing in any way, shape, or form. We've right. never talked really about politics, and I guarantee you that no one knows where I stand. So I don't right. know what she was talking about. Uh, just maybe because maybe I mentioned, maybe I said Clinton, or maybe I said Trump, and then they thought that was right wing. Or you they never know. It's like maybe I just mentioned. Uh, I don't know. Well, so. I stand for uh, America, and I think that's a great place. Well, for I was. Us a, to end the show. And, and in fact, before we end the show, uh, yesterday was Veterans Day. Yes. Today, everybody's celebrating Veterans Day. It's Monday. I was a veteran and we're able to do this podcast because of our veterans uh we're able to do this podcast because we have freedom and so thank a veteran also not only a veteran thank the families that support veterans people forget about the husbands and the wives and the daughters that stay and their sons that stay behind or the mothers and fathers that stay behind while they go fight our battles while we can kind of live free so don't only thank a veteran thank their families beautiful that's a terrific way to end it thank you Great. Thank you all, and we'll see you next time, and thanks for checking in. It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn, teaching you to be the hotelier that you want to be. It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn.